again, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to this uh, special invited guest lecture. And I'll briefly introduce the speaker and hand over to the speaker. So the speaker is Professor Roland Horn. He is a Thomas Davis Barrow Professor of Earth Science and Professor of Energy Resource Engineering at Stanford University. Furthermore, he's uh, the director of the Stanford Geothermal Program. He was the chairman of the Department of Petroleum Engineering at Stanford uh, from 1995 to 2006. He's best known for his work in well test interpretation, production optimization, and tracer analysis of fractured geothermal reservoirs. He's a member of the US National Academy of Engineering, and he served on the International Geothermal Association Board for a total of nine years, and from 2010 to 2013 also as its president. He was a technical program chair at the World Geothermal Congress altogether for three times. So uh, let us welcome our speaker. He will talk for about uh, uh, 50 or 55 minutes, and there will be some 15 minutes for question and answer time at the end. Okay. All right, good morning, and thank you very much for attending my lecture. Uh, let me begin by apologizing that uh, although I speak a little Japanese, it's not very good, and therefore today I'm going to speak to you in, uh, in English. But I'm sure that all of you will understand with no problem. So my subject is geothermal energy. And I like to refer to geothermal energy as underground energy. Number one, because it's underground. And number two, because many people don't know about it. Everybody knows about wind and solar, but geothermal is not so widely understood. So Perhaps we can learn a little bit today about geothermal energy. So over the last, uh, oops, let me go forward a bit. These are the topics I'm going to talk about in, uh, in uh, today's lecture. We talk about geothermal in the context of renewable energy, uh, where we are in the world, and also I make some reference to where we are in Japan in geothermal and how we can integrate geothermal energy into other sources, other renewable sources. And in particular in Japan, this is something of a unique case to the nation of Japan, is a kind of a collision between geothermal electricity production and onsen industry. So it's actually a, a, a characteristic in Japan which is not seen in other countries. I'd like to talk about that. And I'll finish by talking about uh, some ideas for the future in Japan and in the world. So every five years, you heard about the World Geothermal Congress. Every five years, it's like the Olympics. Every five years, we hold that Congress, and many people come from uh, 80, 90 countries and talk about their ambitions and their achievements in geothermal energy. And so every five years, we have this inventory of geothermal resources around the world. And so you can see from all the way back to 1950s how the capacity of geothermal energy has increased. That's the blue one at the bottom. And the pink one, the squares, are the actual generation also increasing. So totally in 2015, that was the last geothermal world congress, uh, the, the world in total was producing about 12.5 uh, megawatts in capacity from geothermal energy. So for reference, um, actually I don't know the capacity of Japan, but probably around 300 megawatts total, something like that. So it's a small piece of that, um, but nonetheless an important characteristic in, in many of the countries in which it's found. Uh, but importantly also, too, you see this blue dot on the right-hand side, uh, this one. That is the projection to 2020. 
you can see a kind of an increase in the expansion of development of geothermal energy of the world. That is not achieved, that is actually planned and, and in development. This is not just an idea, but actually people building our stations now. Now, these are the important geothermal countries of the world, and I've shown them in order from number one to number 10. Um, and USA at the bottom is number one, Japan at the top is number 10. But importantly, what you can see about this graph is how the picture in the world is changing as a function of time, and most importantly, how it's changing in recent times, in the last five years or last 10 years. So you can see there are several important countries that I've marked with the arrows that made huge changes or huge expansion of their geothermal uh, production and capacity. So those countries are Indonesia, uh, Turkey, and Kenya, and to some extent also uh, New Zealand. Okay, and if I show the same graph, oops, very sensitive, same graph actually separated one by one, you can see those countries rapidly expanding uh, in their developments over time. And most importantly, there are some in particular, uh, like Turkey, which had almost nothing, and then it ramped up almost uh, to exceed almost all of the competing countries. It's now number four. Uh, Indonesia also, you see, actually just about three months ago exceeded Philippines to become number two. So Philippines was number two for a long time, but Indonesia has actually more uh, geological advantage, and therefore they've, they've been able to move ahead. And this one is Japan. Why Japan is so flat is something we'll talk about uh, the onsen issue is one of the reasons for that. Another reason is the ecological issues. M many of the geothermal resources of Japan are found inside of national parks, and that is a limitation in the actual achievement of those resources. Uh, and again, looking at the same information in a different way, this is showing the top 10 countries for the year of 2018, last year. And importantly, you can see what they had in 2017, that's the yellow, and what they had in 2018, which is in the red. So importantly, you can see these countries are adding significant amounts of geothermal energy to their total capacity. So Indonesia and Turkey were the most prominent in that regard. Uh, this is Japan. So Japan was a very early developer of geothermal energy, actually a kind of pioneer. The first geothermal plant in Japan, in Kyushu, in Otake, was built uh, 50 years ago, still in operation today. And uh, Japan led the world, actually, in many of those kind of early developments. It continued up through the 1990s. Uh, you can see the expansion here as a function of time. But then after that, since 1990, the last 20 years or so, geothermal energy just is slowly fading away. Uh, geothermal developments are taking steam from the ground, bringing it to the surface and converting it to electricity. And over time, the resources in the subsurface tend to run down. And so that's the reason for this slow declining slope that you see in these figures. And also to the blue line, you can see the average utilization of the capacity of the power plant is slowing down. And again, that's because of the availability of steam in the overall system. So that seems a little bit discouraging in Japan, but things changed in 2011, and you'll know why, for the Fukushima nuclear accident. Um, the government policy towards geothermal energy in the 2000s, 2000 to 2010, was not interested. But as a result of Fukushima Daiichi accident, uh, geothermal came back into 
public interest and government interest and business interest as well. However, geothermal developments are not quick. It takes a long time to develop a geothermal power station. Uh, 10 years would be typical. So start, starting in 2011, that vehicle started moving again and the geothermal industry within Japan itself started to move forward with new projects. So there are some promising developments. This is a small um, geothermal plant in, in Hachimantai, 10 megawatts in size. Uh, I took this photograph in the summer of last year, 2018, and this plant is now in operation. Uh, this is a Sugawara plant in Kyushu. It was the most recently constructed large-scale utility plant in uh, Kyushu. And most importantly, it is of a new type of power plant compared to the ones which existed before. So you can see in the title, this is a so-called binary power plant. Uh, and the reason that binary power plants are important is because they're able to achieve uh, electricity production with low quality resources. This geothermal field was discovered 30, 40 years ago, but it wasn't developed because the quality of the resource is not so good. The temperature is low compared to the plants which were developed, Otake, for example, in other places. So although this power plant is a little bit small, it represents a step forward in the kind of development which Japan is now making. It's not the only bi binary plant in Japan, but it's the first kind of large scale, utility scale one. And this is something we should talk about too. I am, I am a RESO engineer as I was introduced to you. My technical interest, my research interest is in the subsurface. However, there are many other aspects of geothermal energy which are important too, which are on the surface in particular the power plants themselves. And what you can see here is a representation of all of the geothermal power plants in the world, every single one, and who manufactured the turbines. And you can see all of those companies listed there. And this is a graph showing the total megawatts, the actual electricity capacity of those plants. And what you can see is number one, number two, and number three, are all made in Japan. So Toshiba, Mitsubishi, and Fujidenki are the primary sources for geothermal turbines in the world. Uh, interestingly enough, you can see number four is Israel. Why Israel? There's no geothermal energy in Israel, actually. But the, there's an Israeli company which was innovative in the design and construction of geothermal power plants. And in particular, their focus, their complete focus, is on binary power plants. And because of that, uh, ORMAT has made many, many, perhaps as many as 100, rather small uh, geothermal power plants which are used around the world. So in total number, they actually have uh, probably more than anybody else, but their plants tend to be small. And then you can see Italy, and then a large number of other countries. And this is showing you know, where geothermal power plants are manufactured and where they're actually used. This is sort of a map of where geothermal turbines come from and where they go to. And you can see uh, in here, so this is uh, Toshiba, Mitsubishi, and Fujidenki. And this is Ormat, which is the Israeli company sending turbines around the world. And I, I took this photograph in Singapore in the uh, summer of 2015. I, I was riding on the street, and I saw this taxi next to me, which has an advertisement on the side for Fujidenki geothermal turbine. Not just Fujidenki, but Fujidenki geothermal turbine. That's what's written in the backside over here. I was amazed by that. 
because it's the only place in the world where I ever saw a geothermal turbine being advertised in public. Uh, I don't know if people in Singapore want to buy geothermal turbines, but anyway, that was part of the view in Singapore. I also have a very good friend who works for Fuji Denki in, t in, uh, in uh, Kawasaki, so I took that photograph for him. All right, so let's talk about you're interested in sustainability and you're interested in the overall picture. So let's talk about that. This is my second subject. How do we fit geothermal energy into other renewables? And again, I'll show you the picture in Japan. Uh, Japan has had geothermal energy all the way back until 1960s, uh, but this shows only the last 20 years, the century that you all born in. The geothermal energy is this little yellow bar. In the year 2000, geothermal energy was quite a big fraction of the renewable energy which was produced in Japan. Uh, the total amount today is almost the same as it was then. Uh, there's a few new plants that I mentioned and actually two more than the one I showed you. What you can see is the big expansion of wind, the blue one, and the big expansion in solar, even more uh, than wind, which is the green one. The red one down here at the bottom is uh, hydro. And that presents an interesting problem uh, in how to make those power plants work together. Japan has a, a relatively small fraction of renewable energy coming from wind. It turns out that the wind, the way that the wind blows in Japan is not so suitable for wind. Um, but solar is a much more ad advantageous source in the nation of Japan. And I'll show how that makes a difference in a, sh in a few moments. Uh, in spite of the fact that geothermal is so small, overall, of all of Japan, there are important places where geothermal makes up the largest fraction of renewable energy. So you can see those prefectures, Oita in Kyushu, that's where Otake plant is, uh, and also in the north, Hachimantai, around Morioka and uh, in that region. In fact, the most recent power plant in Japan just began operation about four weeks ago in Akita prefecture. Its name is Sabisawa, thank you. So 40 megawatts, it's very exciting. That's a, the, the first large scale project uh, started in recent time. So you can see the, the, the other sources, but the red bar, which is geothermal, is very significant in specific places. And that's a message which I should carry and which you should remember. Geothermal is very advantageous in places where it is found. There are some countries where geothermal energy makes up as much as half of the energy which is produced. Uh, Iceland, Tibet, El Salvador, those countries actually are very much blessed with geothermal energy. Japan is also blessed with geothermal energy. Japan has probably in total resource feasibility uh, the first or the second largest resource in the world. Indonesia is very similar. So I'm from California, so let me talk about California for a few minutes because our geothermal grid in California is made up a lot with renewable energy and how we integrate renewable energy is an interesting story which is followed similarly also to Japan. So I'm going to show you snapshots of 2010, 2013, 2015, and I think 2017, of how things are changing, and they're changing very, very rapidly in California, same as they are in Japan. So this is all energy. You see this number at the top. All of the this is electricity, not all of energy, but electricity, which was generated in the state of California in 2010. 200,000 gigawatt hours, and about a quarter of it, a little more than a quarter, was generated from renewable sources. And we know, all of us know, that hydropower is renewable. It rains, 
it evaporates, it rains again. Okay, that's renewable. But uh, legally, legislatively in California, or at least in the United States, and in many other countries, uh, hydro is not classified as renewable energy. And that's only a kind of a business or a political decision. Physically, sustainability, it is a renewable resource. And you can see in 2010, it was the largest renewable energy, not politically, but physically, in the state of California. But what you see here is that geothermal was a very important part of our electricity mix in California. Actually, California is number one. I, I showed you the various countries. United States is number one, but most of that is in California. If California was a country, we'd still be number one in geothermal energy. And you can see, oop, uh, solar and wind, very small in 2010. That was only nine years ago. But before leaving this slide, let me also draw attention to Nevada. Nevada is our neighbor state. They're in the desert. Uh, they also had, so we in total had 6% of our electricity from geothermal sources. That's a lot. Uh, Nevada also had 6% of its electricity resources from geothermal energy. And that is extremely important because Nevada is not so blessed with good geology for geothermal energy. Their temperatures are low, their resources are small, and therefore it's much more difficult from a technical and a business perspective, much harder to develop geothermal energy in Nevada than it was in California. California has high temperatures, has huge resources, and very rather cheap to develop. So the fact that Nevada can achieve 6% is significant to what that means for geothermal energy in the world. And remember the plant I showed you in Kyushu, uh, that was the first binary plant, which is the Japan, the first large scale one, which is the same type which is used universally in the state of Nevada because the temperatures are low. Okay, so I, I drew your attention to hydro, okay, 33,000 gigawatt hours in 2010. In 2013, let me talk about hydroelectric first, 23,000. 33,000 to 23,000. What happened? We had a drought in California. California is a desert state. Sometimes it rains a lot and sometimes it doesn't rain so much. Unlike Japan, it rains all the time. We have years, three, four, five years, where it doesn't rain very much. And that introduces an issue in many places, not in Japan, but in, in California. You all understand solar and wind, is intermittent power. Sun comes up in the daytime, sun goes down in the nighttime. You can't have solar energy all of the time. Hydroelectric energy is like that too, except it has a much longer time scale. It rains more in the winter, it doesn't rain so much in the summer, and in California anyway, sometimes it doesn't rain for several years, or at least not so much. But in 2013, we are still at 6%. What you see now is uh, that uh, wind, for the first time, overtook geothermal in the state of California. And moving ahead to 2015, take a look at hydro again, 13,000, 33, 23, 13. That's the drought getting worse and worse and worse. But again, we're still producing at that time 6% of our electricity from geothermal energy. And what you see now is that solar has moved up from something almost nothing in 2010 to 15,000 gigawatt hours in 2015, exceeding wind and exceeding geothermal as well. And finally, this is 2017, and before coming to geothermal, take a look at hydro. Now we're 43,000. The drought is over, rained a lot in 2017, and the hydro came back. 
now what you can see is that solar uh, PV has moved up to a very large fraction of our grid, and that makes it very, very similar to the Japanese grid. Uh, but here's California, still at 6% geothermal, and this one is important, Nevada, our neighbor, now up to 9% geothermal. So, so Nevada has been building and developing uh, their geothermal resources extensively. They don't have so much uh, wind and solar. They have a lot of solar, but not so much wind. Uh, again, just as in Japan, the wind is not very suitable uh, the way that it blows in Nevada. California has a lot of wind energy, which is due to wind coming from the coast. Uh, but of course, Nevada is far inland. And if we look at a particular day, this is about one year ago in the state of California. Actually, if you like to note this website here, caliso.com, probably you have a site like this in Japan too. It shows how much electricity has been generated right now and where it comes from in our state. And you can see at that particular moment, we were producing uh, completely 25 gigawatts and renewable was 11 of it. That's about 40%, not including hydro, okay, because the government excludes that. And you can see the fraction. This is all the renewables in here. And this is the renewable which was being generated. Most of it is solar because this was 12 o'clock, about this time of that day. But it's not like that all the time. Over a 24-hour period, we have electricity with the sun coming up, the sun going down. And so you can see this is the same day. So the picture I showed you was from midday. So much solar, but the solar comes and goes. Uh, the wind is variable any day of the, any time of the day and any day of the year. Usually the wind blows at night in California, not always, but it has a tendency to blow at night. That's very good for us because it tends to compensate for the solar. Here is geothermal, kind of boring, it just stays the same all the time. And actually geothermal power plants like to work that way and some other small sources too. A, a total of about one gigawatt of actual generation over that particular day. In this day, The total energy produced from those three sources, wind, geothermal, and solar, which one was largest, do you, admit, do you think? Actually, solar was largest in total, the volume under the curve. But actually, in spite of the variability, uh, geothermal is more or less equal to wind over a 24-hour period. And sometimes it can be as much as solar if we have a, a, a period of bad weather in the state Actually, solar goes down very low. Geothermal can also exceed solar. So it's a very useful renewable energy source because it fills in the gap. It's not intermittent. It's there all of the time. And the way that we stabilize our grid uh, in California, we, we actually are th throwing away solar energy now. We have too much, uh, is with batteries. And so we have about 100 megawatts of battery capacity in the state of California. But it doesn't do what you think. You would think you would charge the batteries in the daytime and discharge the batteries at nighttime. It's not like that. Actually, what they use the batteries for is to fill in the gap, especially in the afternoon, I'll show you this picture, between noon and uh, 6 p.m. PM is actually the peak demand of uh, electricity in our state. People go home, they turn on the television, they cook their dinner. That's the highest demand. Between noon and 6 p.m., as the solar goes away, our state has to switch on 13 gigawatts of electricity production. It's one third of the total. It has to be switched on over a very short period of time. Not easy to do that. 13 gigawatts is like 13 nuclear power plants. And they don't, they're not nuclear power plants. We actually have only one. But they are gas-fired plants. They need to be started very quickly. And 
what you see here is that the batteries are used to fill in the gaps as the natural gas plants are starting up. And once there is an excess, they use them to charge. So the batteries are being charged and discharged actually almost continuously throughout the day. And we are installing a lot of batteries in order to keep our grid stabilized in that way. So the state of the electricity grid in California is very different than it used to be. We used to want so-called base load power. Base load power is electricity which is available all of the time. We don't want base load power anymore. Base load power is a nuisance for us because you can't switch it off. Nuclear power plant cannot be switched off. It has to be running all of the time. We used to have two in uh, California, but uh, they turned off one of them, mainly because it had some mechanical problems. But actually, the dispatchers of electricity in California hated nuclear power because it was too inflexible. They had to take 1,000 megawatts all of the time, even if they didn't want it. And therefore, it made the, the grid difficult to control. And next year, they're going to switch off the second nuclear plant. We will have no more nuclear in California after next year. And again, the reason why is for grid control and grid flexibility. So the value now in the electricity grid in California is flexibility. And the electricity generators and the designers and planners and government are all working towards flexible availability of electricity. Here's a problem for geothermal. Geothermal is not flexible. Geothermal is like nuclear. It wants to run all of the time. That's because when you switch on a well and you're producing steam, it has to come to a stable thermal state. And that takes 24, 48, sometimes even a week to come into that condition. You can't switch them on and off. And therefore, geothermal is not so convenient for a renewable, a large renewable portfolio electricity grid, at least not in the form that we know it today. So, for young people who are studying energy in the world, including yourselves and our students in California, this is a challenge that needs a new solution. If we can manage it, Geothermal production currently is a lot cheaper than batteries. So the electricity from geothermal in California costs about eight cents per kilowatt hour, roughly eight yen per kilowatt hour. Battery storage is more around 20 or 30 cents per kilowatt hour. It's much, much more expensive. So that kind of innovation is already beginning. And I'll show you some examples of that. This is a, a hybrid plant in the state of Nevada called Stillwater. And what you can see here, this is the geothermal plant in the middle. And it draws steam from a large area, about one or two square kilometers. You can see the pipelines running along the side of the road. And surrounding that plant is a solar farm. So the solar and the geothermal are both operated by the same company. They are not connected thermodynamically. They're connected electrically, and that allows the total system to adjust according to the grid. A binary power plant is least productive in the afternoon when it's hot, because the cooling systems don't work so well. It, it has a maximum power output at midnight, as a minimum power output at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Solar, of course, is the opposite. And therefore, the solar and the geothermal work together to fill the gaps of each of their different ups and downs. And this particular power plant now also has a solar thermal capacity part, which is thermodynamically connected. And during the afternoon, they actually add energy, thermal energy, into the binary power plant from solar. Another example of that is in El Salvador. They do the same thing. They're using solar thermal collectors to 
add kilojoules to the circulating steam of the geothermal plant. And this is a detail that you don't have to come into, but this is the geothermal water. They're adding solar steam here and here and running it through the steam turbine. Now, this is another innovation. This is also a binary power plant. We can recognize it because of the, the way the cooling towers are configured. This is in Puna, Hawaii. And Hawaii, of course, is an island. And because it's an island, it has an isolated grid. If they have too much electricity, they, there's nowhere to send it. California, if we have too much electricity, maybe we can send some to Nevada, or we can borrow from Nevada or Washington or Idaho. But in Hawaii, they can't do that. They have too much electricity. There's nowhere to, to put it. And so this is an unusual geothermal plant in that it is dispatchable. In other words, it can be, con be controlled. Uh, they control it in two different ways. One of them is they have a well which is throttled or adjusted. And then also they have a kind of a bypass. Because this is a binary power plant, what they can do is to take the steam and hot water from coming from the ground and basically go past the power plant and put it back in the ground. It seems like a waste of time, and, and it is. But the point is that it gives them control over the output of the plant when they're not needing the electricity that it generates without stopping the well. Okay, and that's an important innovation in the way that the plant is actually configured. Uh, and then finally, here is another uh, example of an innovative plant. This is a so-called, um, this is also a hybrid plant, but of a different kind. This is a steam turbine, which uses very high pressure, high temperature steam, which exhausts into a binary power plant. There's two plants, more or less, in combination. And that allows the plant to work over a much wider range of conditions than a normal steam turbine or a normal binary plant by themselves. OK, so let's move on to my next topic, which is onsens. So this is a significant problem, political problem. It's not a problem. It's a situation. It's a, it's a political and social situation unique to Japan, which is a barrier to larger development of geothermal energy in your country. So everybody in Japan loves onsen, right? I do. I love to go to onsen. So the public, the Japanese public, understands onsen very much, and they like onsen very much. And any risk or any suggestion that geothermal development would be bad for onsen, nobody wants to do it because they don't want such a risk. And that has been a significant source of hindrance over the last several years, actually over the last 30 years. But there is a solution which is being developed in government policy as well as in engineering business uh, aspects in geothermal energy in Japan because um, these figures come from the onsen industry itself. I don't know if they're accurate or not, but anyway, 137 million people visited onsen in one year. This is some years ago, 2006. Uh, but importantly here, you can see the amount of hot water which was actually discharged from the ground in all of those many resources. You can see the total number here somewhere. Uh, 3,000, about 3 million liters per minute, which corresponds to about 50,000 kilograms per second, which is huge. 50,000 kilograms per second is a massive, massive amount of water. A geothermal well to produce electricity, about 5 megawatts, is about 100 kilograms per second. So this is uh, 500 times larger than that. So that's more discharge than all of the geothermal wells in the whole of Japan for electricity. But what temperature do you like for an onsen? 
40 degrees is the norm. So 40 degrees is a kind of standard temperature for an onsen or people. I don't like it so hot, but Japanese people like it hot. The water from the ground is much hotter than 40 degrees centigrade, usually. Could be 60 degrees, could be 80 degrees, could be 100 degrees, actually, even. So therefore, it is common in onsens that they cool the water. Uh, what you can see here, this is a, a spray towel which is used to cool down the water. Sometimes it's also mixed with colder water. And sometimes also, too, the water is produced from the geothermal wells for the onsen and actually not used at all. They just throw it away. So you can see the total production there at the top and at the bottom here is the fraction of the water which is not never used at all for anything, actually. And it's a lot. Water is just more or less uh, wasted. Therefore, a very clever, in my opinion, uh, government strategy for making friends between geothermal developers and onsen developers is to try to take advantage of that unused or wasted energy. So here are some examples of how this is done. So uh, which one of these pictures is onsen? So here's onsen, 40 degrees centigrade. The discharge of the water might be 70 to 120 degrees centigrade with heat exchanges and other uh, mechanisms, we can extract, instead of cooling it down or throwing it away, we can extract the energy from the hot water, bring it to 40 degrees to use in onsen, and use that extra heat for generating electricity. And we can also even use that extra heat for the hotel itself, the resort for showers or cooking or whatever it might be, without just wasting the energy. So here's an example of such a system, um, which is in uh, Tohoku region, where they're generating 50 kilowatts with a combined system like that. And 50 kilowatts is enough to supply the onsen hotel. So the hotel gets free electricity just for using the energy that they were otherwise throwing away. This changes the point of view of the onsen developers. So then if you're a resort, you get, you don't, you don't lose, you don't take any extra water from the ground. It doesn't impact the onsen, but it gives you a resource that otherwise you would have to pay for. And throughout uh, Japan now, at least the last time I knew, which was now two, three years ago, Kyushu had 14 separate uh, systems like that, the where they're known as micro binary plants. They're small scale uh, plants. There are many of them being deployed around Japan in onsens, and in doing that, they were integrating the two opposing points of view onsen owners and geothermal developers. And here's another example in Tsuchiu. This plant was uh, began operation in 2015. Um, Tsuchiyu is important because it's in Fukushima prefecture. And Tsuchiyu is a very famous uh, hot spring town for hundreds of years. But it's just at the edge of the exclusion zone from uh, Fukushima Daiichi uh, area. And therefore, their economy is collapsed because nobody wants to go there anymore. Um, what they did in Tsuchiyu was to take advantage of their discharging hot water in much the same way as I described. They're taking the extra energy, which isn't needed for the onsen, and they're generating electricity, in this case, 350 kilowatts, which is more or less enough to supply the electricity for the town. And actually, this geothermal plant, uh, this is me here, is now a kind of a tourist attraction. You can go there and have a tour of this plant. It's very interesting. OK, so let me move on to my final topic, which is not electricity, but heat. Uh, this diagram is shows, in the United States at least, the energy that we use in the whole nation. This is not California anymore. How much energy we use in total, it's 100 exajoules of thermal energy, and the temperature at which it is supplied and consumed. 
And you can see there's very large amounts here for heating as houses and factories and things like that, air conditioning, which is very low temperature, 40 degrees centigrade up to 80 degrees centigrade. We have a lot of requirement for very high temperatures too, but not so much actual need. The biggest amount is for these low temperatures. So if we're going to make electricity, we need 250 degrees in California for a conventional geothermal plant. We need 150 degrees in Nevada for a binary power plant. But for a lot of the heat that we need, we don't need anything like that. We need a rather low temperature. So the big news then is for so-called heat pumps. And heat pumps are a way of moving thermal energy around and placing it in places that you would like to use it. My university is kind of similar in size to yours. Uh, we have some more students, but anyway, we have a community of about 20, 13,000 students. We have several thousand professors and we have staff and the students are living on the campus. So it's like a small town, 20,000 people. Our thermal and air conditioning requirements um, are supplied with a very innovative system which makes use of heat pumps. If you're not familiar with a heat pump, actually Japan is the world's largest user of heat pumps. You use heat pumps, your air conditioners, they cool in the summertime, they heat you up in the wintertime. Those are heat pumps. Um, so this is a very big heat pump. We have three of those which supply the heat and the air conditioning for the whole campus of 20,000 people. And the reason that works is because we need heat and cooling at the same time in the buildings. And when we send hot water to the building, it comes back cooler. And when we send cold water to the building, it comes back warmer. And what the heat pump does is it recycles that heat. It takes it back from the returning cold water and it puts it into the returning hot water and just sends it around for a second time. It's a very, very efficient process. In order to exchange six kilowatt hours of energy requires only one kilowatt hour of electricity. It's free heat, if you like. And what you, but what you see is that, just like in Japan, in the summer it's very hot, so we need, we need extra. So th over the balance of the year, the total heat requirement, the area under this, uh, this red curve actually, and the total cooling requirement has about the same. They're equal to each other. But in the winter time, we need more heat. And in the summer time, we need more cooling. So they're not balanced day to day. This bright red part is heating, which is supplied by burning natural gas. And the bright blue part up here is cooling, which is achieved by cooling towers, which you see on the top of every building in, in, in Tokyo. They are throwing energy away and they're heating up the atmosphere. A cooling tower is a device built and sold with only one purpose, which is to waste energy. That's its function. So we're consuming energy in the winter, we're wasting energy in the summer, and our system is going to be redeveloped, or phase two of, our, of that innovative system is to use geothermal heat pumps. And so you can see here a drilling rig on the campus of our university. We're drilling a geothermal well. And in that system, in the summertime, that extra hot water is going to be put into the ground, heating up the ground. And in the wintertime, we take it back and use it for the heating of the campus. So we're kind of using the underground of our university as a storage tank for heat. And when that system is finished, we will no longer burn gas, and we will no longer uh, operate the cooling towers, and we will become, uh, at least from the heating and cooling, carbon free. And very importantly for us in California, you, I told you the story of the hydroelectric. Another thing that cooling towers waste, in addition to energy, is water. So 20% of the water consumption of our campus is dissipated in the cooling towers. And that's a very critical issue in California because of our shortage of water. We're a desert, more or less. So 
shutting off those cooling towers is important for us because we reduce the water consumption of the campus. All right, so I promised you some, some uh, summary and uh, conclusions here. We would like to use, I would like to use, uh, uh, more geothermal energy because it has characteristics which differ from wind and solar. They're not, they don't have that daily intermittency. It also has characteristics different from hydroelectric. Hydroelectric, by the way, is a wonderful way of controlling a uh, dispatchable grid. Hydroelectric stations can be open and closed, not instantly, but anyway, relatively quickly during the day. But as I showed you, at least in California, hydroelectric energy or electricity is subject to annual or, annual or even five yearly changes because of droughts and uh, weather events. So dispatchability is something that we need to achieve in the geothermal industry for our electricity generation if we're going to become part of our new renewable portfolio that so many countries, including mine and including yours, are implementing. Because the only reasonable alternative today, well, battery, I showed you batteries, we're implementing batteries in California, or you're doing battery storage also too in Japan. However, that isn't uh, anything more than a small fraction of the grid control. The biggest fraction is gas-fired plants. Natural gas-fired plants represent 50% of the electricity generation of California, uh, also a very large fraction in Japan. And that gas, in your case, is imported from Australia and other places over the ocean. In our case, it's imported from Texas in big pipelines. And in both cases, it produces a carbon emission, which would be good if we could stop it. So if we can do anything to improve the dispatchability of geothermal energy, we can substitute for natural gas, as can Japan. Small, so-called microbinary or mini binary plants have been very useful in, first of all, in regional areas, places like Hawaii, where they have an isolated grid, places like Alaska, where they have small communities which are not connected to the grid, um, and island communities like the Caribbean, that they make use of those too. In Japan, they're not particularly important for that reason, because Japan is almost everywhere connected, except little islands like Okinawa and Haneashima and places like that. But the biggest value of small geothermal plants in Japan is slow migration of public opinion. If the onsens begin to feel good about geothermal electricity production, that opens doors for the larger development of geothermal in this country. And we shouldn't think of onsen, I mean, I'm an engineer. I don't think of onsens as competition for that electricity generation. I love onsens too. But it's a family with brothers who argue. They don't have to argue. They can probably get along better than they do. And importantly also too, as you saw from the map I showed of Toshiba and Fuji and Mitsubishi or whatever, geothermal community is not isolated. It actually is a worldwide business. It operates in many countries and in many different places within each country. So with that, let me conclude and I'm ready for your questions. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you for the very excellent uh, and uh, interesting lecture. And now we have about uh, 10 or 15 minutes for your questions. And if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone uh, to you. Um, thank you for a great presentation. Um, my question is about return on investment of geothermal energy. If a country takes much cost, I mean um, investment for um, geothermal energy development, do you think that the country will actually get higher profit than the 
um, like first invested money? If so, could you tell me like, like um, how long years does it take? Um, yes, yeah, so that's a good question. And um, I, I, I'm not able to give you details because I'm an engineer and not an economist, but I'll give you some examples that you might be able to follow up on. Um, as you know, in Japan right now, since uh, Fukushima Daiichi accident, there is a lot of government policy towards uh, development of alternative resources, so-called feed-in tariffs. And feed-in tariffs are certainly successful in certain places as a way of encouraging development. Your question is about return on investment, and the objective of a feed-in tariff, as far as I understand it, is to improve the return on investment for people who otherwise would not choose to take it. Um, we, we had something similar in, in, uh, in California too, so-called PERPA or SO4 contracts. And the example I'd like to give though is Germany. So Germany has a very large installation and deployment of solar, in spite of the fact that the sun doesn't shine so much in Germany. They also have a large, surprisingly large deployment of geothermal and that's kind of amazing because there's no volcanoes whatsoever in Germany. But Germany took a public and government um, ambition to develop renewable energy and they did it through feed-in tariffs. And the feed-in tariffs both in Japan and in, in Germany for um, all renewables, but including geothermal, is actually extremely high. I, I don't know what it is in Japan, you might know, but in, in Germany, it's 20 to 30 cents per kilowatt hour. It's huge. And bear in mind that you know, the, the, the economic cost of old style geothermal energy in California, eight cents per kilowatt hour. So 20 to 30 cents is a, is a huge benefit for the people who are developing. Is it working? In Germany, it's working because actually they have very many small scale so-called heat and electricity projects which are based upon geothermal energy. And in California, so-called PERPA and SO4, which were, were not feed-in tariffs, but they were sort of guarantees of, of return, more or less, stimulated a wide capacity that I showed you. The reason California is so big, well, there are two reasons. One is we have a gigantic field, the, the world's largest field, which produced 2,000 megawatts by itself in its heyday. And then secondly, um, because of the, not feed-in tariffs, but other mechanisms that were used to encourage development. The state of Nevada, almost all of their developments were stimulated by that kind of um, financial mechanism or, or, or legislative mechanism. Okay, and, uh, thank you. The next question, please. Thank you for a wonderful lecture. Uh, I have a question for uh, initial investment. It's very similar to the first question. And maybe you said that it takes about 10 years to set up power plant. Uh, why does it take such a long time to set up geothermal energy power plant? Uh, why is it so difficult? Yes, so this is a very good and very important question. And in, in many ways, it, it also comes to the return in investment. One of the reasons that geothermal, so in places where the geothermal plants are operating for a long time, such as in Kyushu or whatever, the, the physical cost of the electricity now is extremely small. I mean, there's no fuel cost in a geothermal plant. It's only operating cost. And I don't know what it is in Kyushu, but in some of the plants in Japan, their actual cost of electricity, they, they, don't, they don't, it's kind of a secret, they don't tell you, but it's probably two or three cents per kilowatt hour. It's, it's almost nothing because they, they've written off all of their power plants are already paid for. So after 50 years, looking really good. But that's not your question. Your question is why is it take such a long time and actually that gives rise to such a high cost in the initial state. And that's why feed-in tariffs are important to get over that cost. The reason is, uh, and, and, and there's another problem too, it's not only the time, 
It's also the uncertainty. If you go to the bank and say, please, can I have $100 million? I want to build a solar plant, or I want to build a geothermal plant. The bank can see exactly what that solar plant is going to produce. But the geothermal plant is not so sure because it's subject to geology. And we don't know what the geology is like. It's deep below the ground. We can only see what the geology is like after we drill the wells. And we have to spend tens of millions of dollars to drill those wells without being sure that we're going to get the plant that we would like to have. So it takes time to actually explore to find. So geothermal is not everywhere. You don't have onsens everywhere. Sometimes you have them, sometimes you don't have them, even 10 kilometers apart. And geothermal resources are like that too. This place is good, this place is not good. But which one is which? We have to find out by using scientific, geoscientific exploration. We have to find out by using drilling. And that's why it takes some period of time. And it requires investment, which is not guaranteed to produce a return. So that's a significant impact on the cost of geothermal electricity is the time cost of money and time cost of risk. And in many places, so the feed-in tariff has the advantage of, of withdrawing some of the risk. Basically, the government is taking the risk. And that was also the mechanism of PURPA and SO4 contracts in the, in the United States. The government took some of the risk, and that made the, the, pl the plants economically cheaper. It still cost the same amount of money, but the investors didn't, carry, didn't have to carry the risk by themselves. Thank you. Uh, the next question, please. Yes. Thank you very much for uh, your presentation. And I have a question for the uh, Puna project uh, was, uh, in uh, Hawaii and regarding the uh, loading uh, electric load control is by the well uh, valve throttling. Yes. And uh, m my question is, uh, uh, if it's a ch change of well valve polish, uh, throttling, then maybe I think it's effect of the uh, pond uh, under the ground, effect, not, not, not effect of the, likely the. It, it, <laughs> does, it does have an effect. So the, the throttling the well on and off has, has effect. The, the, the biggest impact is on the well itself because the well is getting hotter and cooler and hotter and cooler, and that, you know, it's made of steel, it's cemented in the ground, that produces stress mm -hmm. on the well. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the reason that normal geothermal plants don't like to do that. Um, but this well is actually designed to be that way. In terms of the subsurface, um, probably not too much of a problem. Mm -hmm. It's like um, Having a bottle of water, you can drink it or you can not drink it, but the water doesn't care. It just waits to be drunk or not drunk. Thank you very much. I, I should mention too, I don't know if you know, but uh, Puna geothermal plant is currently not operating because it was overcome by a volcanic eruption. So the, the volcano, which it's on the side of volcano, volcano erupted and the lava came down and actually covered some of the geothermal wells, and they they, they actually capped them off so they wouldn't they wouldn't uh, uh, be uncontrolled, and they moved away. F they took the they took the pentane out of the binary cycle and they moved it off site, and they basically put the plant in a safe state. They're now redeveloping Pune to go back and drill through the lava to get back to the wells they had before. Okay, thank you. The next question, please. I think you were first. Thank you for your inspiring lecture. And my question is about the geothermal power in Iceland and um, like Japan. Since Iceland is also famous for hot spring, I was wondering, um, is Iceland taking a much more advanced step of utilizing the their hot spring facilities to produce uh, the geothermal electricities. 
Yes, so Iceland is a, an interesting example in several unusual ways. So uh, two-thirds of all, all energy in Iceland comes from geothermal and hydro. It's about two-thirds of the two-thirds, two-thirds of the, that is geothermal, one-third is hydroelectric. And so that includes uh, all energy for transportation, for shipping, because they, their fishing is important for them. All of that is included. So they have a, a huge contribution of geothermal electricity and geothermal heat. Iceland is really cold, and yet 80% of the, of the houses and buildings in Iceland are heated with directly with geothermal water. It comes from the ground, goes through their houses, and even the shower. When they take a shower, the water which washes them has come directly from the ground. They don't have heat exchangers in many places. And furthermore, a lot of the city water, hot water, doesn't come immediately from the ground. It actually goes through the power plant first and then goes to the city for use. And most amazing of all, the biggest tourist attraction in Iceland is a big onsen, which is called the Blue Lagoon. Two million visitors per year. It's the number one tourist attraction in Iceland. It is the waste discharge pond from the Svartsingi geothermal power plant. So the water which comes out of the, ge the geothermal plant, they, they put it into the pond and then people go and bathe in it. It did not exist before the geothermal plant was there. And there are several other examples in Japan. There's another one, uh, sorry, Iceland. Another one in Akureyri, in a geothermal plant called Krafla, where they also made a, an onsen with the wastewater from the electric generation plant. Um, another interesting aspect of Iceland is that, again, it's an island nation. I, uh, Iceland's kind of like Hokkaido. There's not too many people there, and the people live apart from each other. Um, Iceland exports its electricity to Europe, and not through a wire. It's a lot of water between Iceland and Europe. What they do is they import aluminum aluminum ore from Australia to Iceland, and the refining of, of aluminum requires a huge amount of electricity. And because electricity is so cheap, because it's geothermal, and they have a lot, they refine the aluminum with their excess electricity, and then they ship the aluminum products to Europe. So they're exporting their electricity to Europe in the form of aluminum you remember there was one question over here. Uh, who was icing you? Thank you for your presentation. And uh, um, I, I somehow feel like this problem in Japan, why this thing is not big in Japan, is. I feel like maybe it's because of the mindset of the Japanese culture or how they think of things. Like, for example, if you talk about onsen, and my like impression on that is kind of like it's a family business that's last for a long time. So maybe people wouldn't feel comfortable if you just ask them to like use it for another utility, like even if it's for the country's good or the people's good. Um, so, um, mm, and also like recently in Europe and a lot of English speaking countries, the young people have already started the like um, movement, fighting for the future for uh, environment because of the young teenager Greta. But in Japan, like no one is moving at all like for that. So uh, do you feel like there need to be a spiritual big leader in Japan to actually promote this uh, great idea of thermal energy? Okay. So you can also briefly ask. Uh, uh, my uh, one question is, the first question is, uh, what are its effects on the volcanic eruptions or the frequency of volcanoes? So inside the Earth, in fact, we know that it's very hot inside. 
So the geothermal energy will have any effect on the uh, volcanoes. And the other question is, uh, we can tap solar, wind, and um, other forms of energy. In fact, the geothermal is one of them. It can remain the mainstay of the energy mix uh, since the wind and solar are intermittent energy. The, the only problem with us is how to store this energy, uh, not that how to produce. Because we, we do have enough of solar, we do have enough of um, uh, wind, but we cannot uh, store them. Why not our studies should focus on the storage and we should uh, innovate the storage facilities so that we can store and uh, we will not be, maybe, maybe we will not be investing highly in those other power plants as well. Thank you. So if you need to go, you can already leave, but uh, Professor Horn will still give an answer to th these two questions and then we finish. Okay, come on, good. So I'll so answer the first question. So the reason I'm here in Tokyo this week is because I'm attending a conference. So Eckert also was there. It's called the ICEF, Innovation for Cool Earth Forum. It's a Japanese-led initiative worldwide uh, to talk exactly about these issues, integrating of renewables into portfolios, et cetera. So there are certainly, there are leadership initiatives within Japan. It's supported not only by government, but also by business. And the example I gave of microbineries is a good example of how uh, public opinion can begin to be addressed. And you're completely correct. If, if I'm a small operator of an onsen in Kyushu, uh, which has a 20-bed hotel, which has been my family business for 100 years, and you want to build an electric power station close to me and send electricity to Tokyo, I, I don't care about that. I would much rather protect my heritage and my hot water so people don't see the advantage for them. And the reason that I believe that microbineries are such a clever idea is because it gives some advantage to the people who believe they're taking the risk. It, they may or may not be taking a risk, but anyway, they see that something comes back, not to the population of Tokyo, but to their community. Coming to the question of volcanoes, um, the people who live in Hawaii, some of them believe that the uh, volcano erupted because of the, the uh, geothermal plant. Physically, that is improbable, but uh, spiritually, you know, people who believe in the mountain gods, etc., and they, you know, explain such a connection. Uh, in reality, physically, there's or geoscientifically, there's no such connection likely. There is, however, the possibility of a connection between geothermal energy development and earthquakes. Not as much as you might imagine, but nobody wants an earthquake that's made by man. Okay, earthquakes happen because of nature, but if you can say that earthquake was in some way stimulated by uh, somebody drilling a well, then people don't want it. All geothermal developments have earthquakes. Most of them are magnitude, you know, minus two to one, so you, ne you never feel them. But sometimes you might feel something. You, it may have been an earthquake which was going to happen anyway because geothermal energy is typically developed in places where there are earthquakes because of the, the uh, tectonic uh, rim and because of volcanic eruptions. But the connection or spiritual connection or mental connection between earthquakes and geothermal energy development is certainly a societal issue that we have to address. Oh, yeah, maybe you can make a private discussion. Storage <laughs> is good too. We should do that also. We, we and the example I gave at Stanford is an example of that. We, we need to finish. That would be really interesting to continue discussion for another hour. So it's Friday today, and certainly this was a good Friday for the future, and it was geothermal energy for the future. So let's give a final applause to uh, Professor Horn. Right, thank you very much.